I don't want her death to be in vain. I want something meaning, meaningful to come out of her death, that other children don't have to go through what she went through. Canada's indigenous community stares down a suicide epidemic. What's pushing so many to end their lives and what can be done? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. It hasn't been easy to be, uh, to be strong. It hasn't been easy to, to stay positive. Uh. Canada's First Nations and Native Americans in the United States have much higher rates of suicide than non-Indigenous people in these two countries. The suicide epidemic came to light this month as one tribe in Ontario, Canada, saw 11 suicide attempts in one evening. We begin with this report from CCTV's Sean Calebs. wonderful experiences in Canada's indigenous communities. <laughs> Such as the drum dance during the annual Spring Festival in Inuvik, above the Arctic Circle in the nation's Northwest Territories. Oh, I enjoyed it with my whole heart and soul. It's, um, it's a, it's a healing tool for me. Healing is a word often floating around First Nation communities in Canada. Poverty, housing concerns, little hope for economic improvement, help fuel drug and alcohol addiction. And there are thousands of indigenous people in Canada, like Gordon Rubin, coping with the traumatic after effects of what is known as residential schooling. They were um, uh, sexually abused, they were um, um, beaten, they were starved, things of that nature are, are just the, um, the um, beginning of it. Residential schooling started in the late 1800s in Canada. Indigenous children were taken from their families, forbidden to practice their culture or speak their language. Abuse was rampant among the 150,000 or so children victimized. And some 6,000 died before the schools were abandoned in the 1990s. When you've been to a residential school yourself, you, it's hard for you to, um, when you don't realize it, you impose those um, actions onto to your children. This cycle of trauma has in part led to what Canada's government is calling a crisis of suicides in indigenous communities. We have an awful lot of work to do uh, as a country um, to renew the relationship, to um, start uh, offering full respect uh, to indigenous Canadians. Prime Minister Trudeau wants to spend some $6.5 billion in the next five years in indigenous regions on health care, infrastructure, and in an effort to give people hope. Trudeau says young activists are engaged and ready to build. Even after all the um, disrespect and all the terrible things that the Canadian government has been uh, complicit in over the past generations, uh, are ready to uh, work with the Canadian government to uh, start solving these, uh, these very, very real challenges. This action is long overdue, according to many. Canada's health minister points out that while the indigenous people make up only about 4% of Canada's population, their suicide rate is nearly 10 times higher than Canada's general youth population. Sean Calebs, CCTV in Washington. Joining me now from Toronto, Dawn Laval Harvard is president of the Native Women's Association of Canada. With me in the studio, Denise Desiderio is policy director of the National Congress of American Indians. In Ottawa, Cindy Blackstock is executive director of Five Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. And Teddy McCullough is a policy fellow for the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Cindy, let me start with you. We're looking at some shocking figures there. You know, as we've been reporting, in one small community of just 2,000 people, there have been 
a hundred suicide attempts since September. Now, I know this is a broad question, but can you pin the reasons for this? Well, not only is it the multi-generational impacts of residential school that you talked about, but what a lot of your viewers may not know is that the federal government provides funding for all social services and education for children on reserve, whereas the provinces, equivalent to your states, provide it for all other Canadians. And the federal government of Canada has known for the last 16 years that it underfunds these services significantly. And it, uh, these underfunded services cut across all dimensions of children's childhood. They get about 30% less for education, 30% less for child welfare, less health care services, and less access to mental health. And the most tragic thing about these inequalities is that children don't know of that the federal government is shortchanging them. So they start to internalize these inequalities, their inability to succeed on the same terms as other kids, as a personal and cultural deficit. And then when they start feeling badly about themselves, there aren't the array of mental health services available to other Canadians. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, in fact, just this last January, issued a judgment against the federal government calling this underfunding of child and family services to be systemic racial discrimination by the Canadian government and ordered it to stop. And although there was an immediate order for them to stop, they haven't. And so today, the tribunal issued a further order, uh, much more detailed, requiring the federal government to end these inequalities and get these kids a shot at a fair childhood. Denise, we know that these situations, these uh, conditions exist in the United States as well. Are the causes very similar? They are. Uh, in fact, what we were just hearing about the chronic underfunding is something that the United States government is looking at again through the United States Commission on Civil Rights. We have a report that's coming out this spring called the Quiet Crisis Report, and it, it attacks not only the health care issues in Native America and the chronic underfunding of those, but education, uh, economic development, the lack of economic development opportunities on uh, United States reservations um, and across the board the underfunding that has occurred in the federal government that that really like you heard they it kind of makes us the invisible uh, nations in the United States um, conditions exist in our communities that if they were elsewhere uh, there would just be outrage um, for example the the Flint Michigan example um, the whole United States is outraged at the situation in Flint, Michigan that happened because of the infrastructure deficits there, and they should be. Uh, it's not acceptable that children are drinking water, you know, mm. contaminated with lead. But those conditions have existed in tribal communities in the United States for decades. And our youth internalize that, and they think, well, why is it outrageous when someone else has that condition? What about us? And that's the beginning of the less than. And, and that's what causes youth to feel kind of despair and, and that their lives aren't as important as those of other communities. Teddy, you know, I said the figures are shocking, but even more disturbing when we look at suicide rates is the number of young people who are not only committing suicide but attempting suicide, some as young as 10 years old, why young people? You know, I think for the most part, young people, we, as Denise was talking about, we really internalize that a lot more. Uh, we, you know, our, our minds are still developing. Um, teenagers, normal teenagers when you know their parents are yelling at them they think the world is all against them they're still in that state of mind so they're they're more susceptible to um, any of these these negative connotations and when you have racism in your schools and bullying in your schools and when you have a health care system not only a lack of mental health services but also a lack of health quality health care quality education you go into a school the chances that you're going to graduate are very slim. In some communities, you have a 20% graduation rate um, that low. And um, when you're faced with that kind of negative, these negative statistics, what hope is there? And the only thing you know that we can connect with is our culture and our traditions right. when we have nothing else. Dawn, when we look at the suicide rates and the number of people attempting to commit suicide, what kind of impact does it have on Native Canadian communities? This is the biggest tragedy that we face because tragically with our young people, when they're
looking around the communities and they see that they're living in third world conditions. They're living in communities with no clean water, no housing, with no hydro, no, no schools, no employment. The despair really settles in and because they don't see any hope for any kind of future for themselves, that's when the suicide pacts kick in. That's when you know, these young people just see no reason to continue. The biggest tragedy is that there's a ripple effect because if the young people are already struggling with depression, struggling with suicidal thoughts, when one does commit suicide, those who are left behind to grieve that loss are even more likely to to feel that they have no reason to go on because now in addition to their depression they're having to cope with the additional grief of losing a loved one and this can become contagious in communities especially among the young people as they're coping with the deaths of more and more of their loved ones and that's why communities like Attawapiskat are in such crisis. Cindy, as we heard in that report there, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, the relatively new Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, saying that an awful a lot of work needs to be done. He is, in fact, within a few hours meeting with First Nation leaders uh, in Canada to discuss the challenges facing Native Can Canadians. What are your hopes for this kind of meeting? Well, what we want to see is an end to this racial discrimination as fiscal policy, particularly for children. The current budget announced by the new government provides funding, but over a five-year period, and for child and family services and for education, the vast majority of that money does not come for four or five years out. And that means a lot for the life of a child. Children don't have incremental childhoods. They need that opportunity right now, especially in cases of suicide. So I want to see them do that and also invest in culture and language services for First Nations children. Because we know from good research here in Canada that culture and language and attachment to their community and lands are huge protective factors against uh, youth suicide. That and quality and culturally based mental health services. And you think this new government under Justin Trudeau is going to hear these uh, pleas that are being made? Are they going to respond to these challenges? Well, I think that's, uh, that we have to wait and see. Uh, the, what I feel confident about is at least we have the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, which is a binding court authority in right. our country, ordering them to fix it. So it takes it out of the hands of their discretion and makes them do the right thing for kids. So I'm hoping we'll see follow-up on that order very quickly. All right, and Denise, if we look at the situation here in the United States, if we sort of look at the national scale of priorities for this country. I mean, we hear a lot about, you know, uh, health care in general. We hear a lot about building walls to keep illegal immigrants out. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about keeping Muslims out and things like that. On the national scale of priorities, where does the welfare of Native Americans fall? I think that's a good question, and it's uh, something, uh, you know, we have elections coming up, um, and you talk about the priorities, and what we're looking for to hear out of the candidates is where are they going to put the first Americans. Um, you know, we uh, often, as I mentioned earlier, we often feel like the invisible society. You know, things that happen in other communities happen in our communities, but, but the attention isn't there. Um, and that's why programs like this are really great, because we can kind of communicate uh, are the needs of, of Native Americans, but you know we need more than um, promises. You know it, it's really time that the gap is starting to really um, affect our communities: the healthcare gap, the education gap, the workforce gap. In, in a way that we're just being left behind in in ways that it's going to be really hard for us to recover from if we don't have serious action at the federal level um, and at the tribal level. Um, I, one thing I would say is tribal governments always talk to us at NCI, and, and we don't think the federal government is the answer. If the federal government were the answer, the failed policies would not be still impacting us. Um, and tribes are really saying to the government, like, give us the resources we need, and then let us, you know, do what needs to be done to help our future leaders. Because when you're talking about this crisis of youth in Native Americans, like, nobody has more invested than 
than tribal people, communities and you know these are the future yeah. of our communities and we're more invested in in seeing them succeed than anyone we're just asking for the resources and the tools to um, like was mentioned provide the culturally based solutions that exist in tribal communities okay we are going to take a break right now coming up it's not just suicide ravaging these native communities up next we look at other plights facing american and canadian indigenous groups plus possible solutions and a way forward stay with us you're watching the heat Welcome back. We're talking about the challenges facing native Canadians and Americans. We've addressed the suicide epidemic in these two countries, but there's more work to be done, as we heard. Still with me, Dawn Lavelle Harvard is president of the Native Women's Association of Canada. Denise Desiderio is with the National Congress of American Indians. Cindy Blackstock is with the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. And Teddy McCullough is from the Centre for Native American Youth. Welcome again to all of you. Teddy, you know, when we look at these... Uh, the hopelessness that exists mm -hmm. uh, in certain places. I mean, as Cindy told us, there is discrimination. There's widespread discrimination, yeah. some of it very blatant. But what other kinds of systemic barriers do young people face in these places? When you, there's a few things. Um, I'd, I'd like to point out there was a recent report that came out that showed that young people, young Native people, are coming, are born with and are living with the same rates and the same effects of PS PTSD mm -hmm. that soldiers coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq have. And so there's a whole, a whole slew of different things that, are, are, um, that we're facing, whether it's uh, the education, the lack of education, the lack of a quality education. Uh, there's, uh, we talked about healthcare, generally speaking, uh, oral health, uh, Oral health is a big thing that we're focusing on because you imagine you're going to school, you have a tooth that's been pulled out. Most uh, tribal communities don't have dentists and they lack, lack the trust to go to a dentist because, you know, some dentist might just pull the tooth out because they don't want to drill and fill and all that kind of stuff. Um, kids have to travel three plus hours to get to a, a dentist or any health provider. Um, we our communities are in remote, some communities are in very remote areas where you're not, you don't have access to the things that any other American might have access to. Um, and so yeah, I think there's, there's a whole slew of things. Um, the housing, um, poor access to housing, you have houses that are without running water, uh, without plumbing, without heat, without doors, and the federal government is responsible for mm -hmm. providing these things. Dawn, when we look at uh, health care resources that are available to these communities, I want to look specifically at one particular type of health care, and that is mental health care. I mean, do people have access to things like therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists? Because we're talking about suicide rates going up here. Unfortunately, in many of our First Nation communities, they don't have access to even the most basic health care. I mean, we had an incident of a five-year-old boy who died of strep throat. And, I mean, how does that happen in 2015 that a child dies of, of the most common illness that every child gets, but it's because we don't have even the most basic health care in many communities. And unfortunately, that translates into absolutely we don't have access to the kind of mental health supports that are needed. I've seen in the urban centers how if there's a suicide or if there's a shooting or a tragedy in one of the local schools in the urban center, they have entire crisis teams. You know, the staff, everybody pulls together. They have teams of people going into the schools. And yet in our most vulnerable communities where they have suicide after suicide, you know, it's, it's the teachers who are there 24 hours being asked to be there for the children because they don't have even one mental health worker in that community and they're left to struggle and cope and try to get through this on their own. So unfortunately, there is essentially post-traumatic stress, not only for the, the children in the community, but the teachers in the schools who are struggling to cope, the nurses, and it really does start to 
ripple and it starts to break down the coping mechanisms of the entire community when you don't have any access to the kind of mental health supports that the rest of Canada really takes for granted. And if, if I could add on to that, um, the only time that it seems that we get the resources we need are when we're in crisis. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, these response teams that are coming out to the communities now when there's a spate of suicides, which is very appreciated. Um, but we don't get the resources before. Um, so we don't see the kind of health care um, access prior. There's no access to the preventative, the behavioral health. That could actually stop the suicides. Right. The only time that we get our resources is after uh, an emergency has occurred, an emergency situation. So we have to be at crisis level to get the basic services and health care that folks take for granted in other communities every day. Right, and what you want is continuous health yeah. care and access to health care. Cindy, the uh, regional chief in Ontario, uh, Isidore Day, and she said the cycle of poverty, poor health, suicides, and violence will continue for another generation if the uh, determinants of health are not addressed right now. And, you know, here's something that a lot of our viewers around the world may find surprising when we look at Canada. I mean, this is a wealthy country, a developed country. Yes. It's got a globally admired national health care system. How is this happening? It's been going on for, for decades, and I think it's become so normalized in Canadian society. In fact, that's one of the most horrifying things, is that this racial discrimination against children has been going on for decades, and these kids have been receiving less. But caring Canadians who don't know any better are actually judging these children often as if they get more benefits than other Canadians. And the kids internalize that. So one of the things that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that just wrapped up its study on residential schools really said there needs to be a huge effort put into educating non-Aboriginal Canadians about the situation regarding First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples so that we can correct these injustices and bring them into alignment with what the values that Canada says it has for itself and espouses to the world because right now there's a huge disconnect. Denise, you know, some of the problems we heard about in Canada was the fact that, I mean, there are basic things that people uh, do not have access to. Housing, mm -hmm. clean water. Is that the situation here as well? It definitely is. Um, we have uh, the largest disparities in uh, just about every area. And when Teddy was talking earlier, um, that's what youth internalize mm -hmm. um, when they see that. Um, when your government is treating you as basically a second level citizen, that's what you start to internalize. And we have the same problems. And what's happened is, you know, a lot of people say funding's the answer. And you could put all the funding that you want in health care today, but if you don't address the health care or the housing needs, the education needs, and provide economic development, then you're throwing uh, money at one area. Um, we, we silo things here in the United right. States. Um, and what we at NCI have been asking the federal government to do is, is take a holistic approach uh, to the needs in Native communities. And, you know, you can't bring a teacher to a school and retain that teacher if you don't have housing. You can't have law enforcement on reservations if you have no place to house them. So, so these public safety, health care education needs, housing, they're all intertwined. And we have to find a solution that um, tackles all of those before we can really succeed in any one area. Right, and Teddy, I'm sure when you find these kind of conditions among these communities, there's also, you know, you always see higher rates of alcohol and drug abuse, uh, domestic abuse, sexual assault, violence, all that contributes to this extremely, extremely difficult situation there. Yeah, I, I, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, I've seen it in my family. I'm sure if you ask anyone in this country, you, they have someone in their family that they know who is using or abusing alcohol. And unlike, you know, unlike what is commonly said, Native people aren't susceptible we're not genetically susceptible to alcoholism. Right, right. It's just the environments that we live in put us in a, in a place where these alcoholism rates, these drug abuse rates are inflated. And, for, and it's it, among youth as well. We travel the nation and we meet with young people and they're, they're talking about people as young as 11 or 12 using meth, mm -hmm. using heroin, and that's also a major issue in, in our communities.
Uh, Dawn, in that meeting that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is having with uh, Canadian uh, native leaders, the government is pledging $8.4 billion over the next 10 years to Indigenous <coughs> programs specifically. Is that enough? Actually, even though this seems like a significant amount of money, and it unquestionably is much more than we saw under the previous Harper government, the challenge is that it simply isn't enough to meet the needs of communities that have suffered under decades of neglect. And so, you know, trying to play catch up now, unfortunately, requires much greater upstream investments here to address a backlog of neglect in communities that have been under-resourced, underfunded by the federal government for decades, if not generations now. And it's going to take more than one federal budget, absolutely. It's going to take more than even one term of government for the Liberal government. It's going to take successive terms of significant investment to really start closing the gap so that the circumstances that the living conditions of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Canada are comparable to the rest of the citizens in this country who have a very good standard of living, a very good quality of life, and our people are suffering. And most often, and we were talking earlier, is that this happens because we have remote communities that are cut off from the rest of Canada. They don't have roads. The only way in and out of the communities is with airplanes. And often, you know, if a flight is $3,000, nobody is going in or out of the community. Right. And so the rest of the country simply doesn't know how bad things have got because they don't have to look at it, because they haven't seen it. It has been hidden for generations. And that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Chat with us about this or any other show on Twitter. We're at CCTV underscore America. We also use Facebook. Find us at facebook.com slash CCTV America. I'm Arnon Vidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.